ओम भूर्भुव स्वह तत्सवितूरवरेण्यम भर्गो देवस्म धीयो न प्रचोदया शांति 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 नमस्ते माय डियर फ्रेंड्स आई एम स्टार्टिंग वीडियोस on a great treatise on vedanta the meta physics of the upanishads vichar sagar of swami nischana nischalananda this is a very very famous work on the advaita vedanta before i start the actual book i will clarify certain important terms which will help the sadhakas to understand the basic philosophy of vichar sagar vide view of facilitating an enquirer of self knowledge to comprehend the main doctrine of the upanishads which forms the subject of the accompanying treatise a few explanations are needed and it is hoped that they will be of much help to him no individuality or the oneness of the individual and universal spirit is the subject to be demonstrated and an elaborate and critical analysis of the rival systems which look upon them as different and otherwise have been fully discussed that doesn't concern us for the present what we propose is to lay down a few salient points to give a skeleton sketch leaving the rest to our author in the discussion of his subject he has brought in a mass of arguments from all available sources the work itself is a result of a vast amount of reading and whatever is worth knowing of the vedas mimansa nyay sankhya purana jat chatra has been included in it it contains likewise a discussion of the merits of personal and impersonal forms of worship and seeks to satisfactorily account for the apparent and seemingly anomalous dictum of the several puranas wherein each set up a different form of worship and particularly insisting upon it in lieu of others in this way the different sects of worshipers west vishnuites shivite ganpat sakta who have hitherto been taught to regard his special deity to be superior to the rest will find much to unlearn reason and analogy with the proofs derived from the shastras have been amply introduced to help the comprehension and to erect at much labor a neutral ground where the most inveterate bigot will cast away his rancor and shake hands in fraternal love and harmony with one whom he had hitherto looked upon as a fool and knave thus 
their deaths then there is much to engage the attention of the reader caste and creed stands not in the way of acquiring the knowledge inculcated here for we find no mention about it by our author the only caste he seems to recognize is that of qualification and any person having the necessary qualities may profitably engage himself in its study he will find much to interest him much to engage his attention much to evoke his sympathy the scale from his eyes will be dropped off and it is hoped he will rouse to realize a new existence the clue to solve the mighty problem of existence the end and aim of human life is here spoken out with as much fervor as its dignity demands and though and though to realize it and form the basis of turning a new life can only happen to the fewest of the few to those who have shown the seeds of knowledge in their previous births yet it can be profitably made use of by all alike with this preamble we enter into the few necessary explanations which we have promised at the outset brahma is described as sat chit ananda sat signifies existence chit intelligence and ananda bliss it is therefore essentially existence intelligence and bliss in the mundaka upanishad the story is related of the illustrious son of sanka who desirous of knowledge repaired to angiras the sage and enquired of him what that was which being known everything else would be known he was told in reply that the wise regard the invisible intangible unrelated colorless one who has neither eyes nor ears nor hands and feet eternal all pervading subtle and indestructible as the cause of all that exist this is the impress impersonal god of the vedas called severally by the names of prabrahma brahma and parmatma it is said prior to the evolution of the objective world there was present only sat the one existence par brahma without name or form for name and form are indications of creation and what is created is open to destruction hence non eternal therefore parbrahma being eternal is devoid of both the three expletives one secondless and existence ekam ibam advitam with which parbrahma is always connected are only for differentiating it from bodies similar and dissimilar that is to say as it is one and secondless and <clears throat> there exist not another body of its kind in as much as it is eternal while the world and its contents are non eternal it has only one indication but a sect of buddhist madhimiks content that in the beginning there was present asat or nothing instead of sat virtually they teach that nothing produced everything which is clearly impossible <clears throat> now if it is said as par brahma also existed in the beginning whence did the materials come from which the world was usurped into existence the reply is as steam exists potentially in water so was prakriti maya or agyana so many names of matter residing potentially in the supreme brahma <coughs> to be more explicit par brahma is the supreme force residing within matter in its primordial condition or cosmic state 
thus then we have both matter and force or matter and motion as the western scientist would have it to satisfactorily account for whatever that exists so much in common with the materialist only the difference is yet <coughs> more mud for while materialism discard any here after the vedantin looks upon metaphysi meta psychosis as the <coughs> in inevitable lot of humanity and as life means suffering and incessant struggle he wants to crush the seed which produces the tree of life and lays his ex at its root so that there be nothing left to produce it again we purposely refrain from entering into the arguments both for and against as they have been amply dealt with by the author our is only a pencil sketch and this the reader is requested to keep in mind <clears throat> now then with regard to intelligence there are three states of consciousness called respectively the waking dreaming and dreamless slumber it is said that consciousness of all the three conditions is one the difference consists in the multiformness of the objects which consciousness covers in other words the several acts of cognition brought about by the sensory organs sight hearing touch smell and taste relate to one consciousness though the objects which that consciousness takes possession of to render them perceivable may be many and varied and what is one is always eternal as the supreme brahma being eternal is also intelligence in the <clears throat> mandukya upanishad brahma is described as neither conscious nor unconscious neither is it cognizer nor the object cognized the purpose of all that is to show that it is knowledge in the abstract indicating cognition and not the subject of cognition for that would be incompatible with the truth and infinity now infinite cannot be marked or limited by anything in any direction and a knowing subject must have objects and cognitions to limit it hence prabrahma is not a cognizer moreover in that case a dualism would be involved for whenever there is consciousness there is relation and re <coughs> relation <coughs> implies dualism in this way the knowledge of the supreme brahma like the heat in fire is the abstract essence itself man derives his powers of discovering or discerning from reflection of intelligence in the internal organ antah karna or mind now this reflex intelligence is a reflected shadow of the intelligence of brahma which for its close proximity shades its luster in the same way as a red flower kept close to a crystal shades its color on the glass and it appears red or to quote a familiar illustration as a needle is moved by a magnet when held close to it thus then brahma is self luminous and all objects derive their luminosity from it the word intelligence is here intended to convey a very wide meaning it may be taken for vitality or life essence too because it is universally present from the in sentient molecule of atomic dust to the huge andes or himalayas from the rank weed infesting a stagnant pool of rain water collected in the roadside ditch to the gigantic banyan and from the tiny fly dancing and frisking before our eyes to man each and all has its particle of vitality its individual unit of intelligence which keeps it in its present condition of activity 
all are equally dependent on Brahma, hence its another name or designation is the source of all. Brahma is likewise described as bliss. Bliss signifies cessation of misery. As in deep sleep, when there are no dreams to trouble him, a man cuts off his connection with the objective world and is perfectly insensible to pain. He may therefore be said to be in the highest enjoyment of felicity. And his personal experience also goes to establish it. Since on rising from sleep, he exclaims, <clears throat> I was sleeping happily. I knew nothing then or in the condition of being absorbed into Brahma. Here everything is joy and there is no pain. We all have it in common. Ignorance is an obstacle to our perceiving it and if that can be destroyed by knowledge, all illusions are at an end. The relation we establish with our connections and worldly goods lose their hold and we are on the road to Nirvana. <clears throat> the importance of knowledge is thus clearly established, but of all knowledge is that which tends to know the nature of self is paramount and this is called a crown. But we may be asked how can matter have any resemblance to ignorance and why it is called so. We proceed to answer. Ignorance is called in the Veda as neither existent nor non-existent and something indescribable. Existent is so far as it is everywhere present for no one can say that he knows everything consequently he is ignorant and non-existent because knowledge drives it away and with that object it has been described as antagonistic to knowledge it is quite distinct from real and unreal as neuter is neither male nor female in this way Though ignorance is universally present, it cannot be mistaken for Brahma, which also is universally present. Likewise, there is another simplitude for similitude for both of them are declared to be unborn because Brahma is eternal and ignorance is not. For with the advent of knowledge it disappears or is reduced to non-being, therefore it is unreal. While Brahma is real, therefore as ignorance cannot be particularized one way or the other, as it is neither real nor unreal, neither existent nor non-existent and as it cannot be said to be with or without shape it is hence indescribable it cannot be extended want of knowledge is ignorance for want is negation non-existent and unreal while knowledge is positive existent and real therefore they cannot be connected with each other. Ignorance abounds in darkness and knowledge abounds in luminosity. That again constitutes another difference between them and for this. Darkness which is identical with insentiency, ignorance and matter are one. What has been said in regard to ignorance applies equally to maya but maya is called illusion and it may be asked why because it is the very nature of illusion to make an unreal substance appear real like object seen in a dream illusion can be removed only by knowledge hence the imperative necessity of acquiring self-knowledge cannot be too often repeated we regard the world as something real and hanker after the acquisition of property and accumulation of riches with the false hope that they will procure bliss and felicity. 
it is an illusion to think so likewise the attribution to self of bondage and to regard him as an agent or instrument or one who is a doer of works is also due to illusion all our sense perceptions the cold in the hand the smell in the nose sight and hearing are illusions yet essential to existence for as in the instance of a snake created in a rope an illusion of sight the mistake is removed when the rope is fully known so the mistaken attribution of bondage ceases only with the thorough knowledge of self having thus done with ignorance and illusion it remains only to consider matter or prakriti the best definition of matter is that which occupies space but a vedantin says it is to be indescribable because we are so little acquainted with its nature and properties and the way and the ways in which it works that the above epithet is very appropriate matter is said to possess three attributes these are the sattva or good raja or active and tama or dark and as every object in nature is derived from the elements ether water fire air and earth therefore all of them have these properties more or less in one sense the so called properties are nothing else but distinct forces and we have the say parallel of the forces of attraction and gravitation etc now this can be established in the following wise it is said the first sattva is light the second tama is heavy and the active force now sattva and tama can do nothing till overpowered by raja thus then what is light has an upward motion as gases glazing fire etc the sensory and active organs for their acute perception and ready prehension are likewise said to be derived from the sattvic quality it is likewise possessed of luminosity motion is due to the active quality or raja it in induces action everywhere it sets the air in motion the mind for its unsteadiness is also said to be a product of this quality tama is said to be heavy because it obstructs the luminosity of sattva hence ignorance is said to be a product of tama the first and the last have no velocity or motion till acted upon by the second which also receives a check from the heavy tama so that raja or the active quality cannot lead tama anywhere and everywhere for by its force tama counter balances its action hence there is no breach in the order and synchronism of natural laws we have hence we have here a satisfactory explanation of intelligence in nature it is a stereotyped argument of anthropo anthropomorphism that law signifies a law giver and as there is a display of intelligence in natural laws that proves the presence of mind and for that mind to remain there must be a requisite body hence god almighty has a body etc but a pantheist says such a creator can neither be infinite nor all pervading his pervasion must be limited by his body for he cannot be present everywhere at the same time the special pleadings of both these views need not concern us as they are beyond the scope of the present notice we therefore pass on to consider the elements at first sight 
it may appear strange that our forefathers were taught to believe the so-called elements as simple body that would imply their ignorance of physical science and chemistry notably for we in our time have been taught by western science to regard water air and earth as compound there is hydrogen and oxygen in water air contains oxygen and nitrogen besides an add mixture of carbonic acid and etc and earth is a mixture of several substances but there is no necessity for such an apprehension for the elements find no place in western science the so called elements of the west are liable at a future period when chemical analysis and synthesis will have attained more perfection to be decomposed or resolved into other simpler substances but with regard to our classification that shall never happen it is said the elements of which we have knowledge and which we are accustomed to use for our daily wants are different from what they were in the beginning hence we have the subtle and gross elements the latter are a result of peculiar forms of mixture called quintuplication panchi karna as follows divide each element into two equal parts of the remaining 10 parts take the first five of each element and divide into five equal parts then leaving the undivided second half of each element add to the above mentioned four parts the second half of the other four elements each to each thus then we have one element each an eighth part of itself while the rest is made up by the other four elements and their presence is demonstrated in the possession of qualities which naturally belong to them that is to say ether is said to possess the quality of transmitting sound while air has sound derived from its cause ether besides its individual property of touch in the same way fire has sound touch and form water sound touch form and taste while earth has sound touch form taste and smell from the same elementary combination have originated the seven abodes placed one above the other bhur bhuvar swar mahar janas tapas satya and the seven neither spheres one below the other severally called atala vitala sutala arasatala kalatala and mahatala and patala together with brahmanda the four varieties of physical bodies with their adequate food and drink in respect to air and water we find them mentioned in the shruti mimamsa nyay and other systems that they are compound and not simple bodies their composite nature is easily demonstrable for instance water is left to stand will deposit a sediment of mud which is nothing else but earthly particle even in the clearest sample of water it is easy to detect the presence of earthly <coughs> earthy salts but this cannot be practically proved in the case of the other four elements moreover it is said that some of the five five bhutas elements in bhutas elements in their subtle form have been mixed with similar subtle atoms of a second element and have thus helped the production of the gross while other atoms have produced similar results without any mixture in short the gross is a changed condition of the subtle with and without a blending of their atoms in the gross elements we have a prolific cause for the material universe 
what is ether the atmosphere which surrounds the globe does not extend beyond 30 or 40 lignes and diminishes in substance in proportion to its elevation above the earth's surface it is therefore not very high beyond it it is the planetary ether of physicists and astronomers it fills all space and is drawn into the interstices interstices of the solar system the stars nebula etc it is all pervading it may be called a fluid but it resembles the air we have though much rarefied than it in the calculating the speed of heavenly bodies resistance of ether is taken into account by astronomers hence it is impossible to deny its existence thus far we have been mainly concerned in introducing our readers to the significance signification of the technical terms abound, abounding in the philosophy which form the subject of the present treatise without a proper comprehension of the terms that will frequently occur it is impossible to master the subject in all its details hence it was necessary that they should be explained we we purpose now to touch upon the cardinal doctrines of vedantism these are besides known difference of the jiva and brahma the doctrines of karma and meta psychosis karma is the collective totality of works good and bad which an individual performs in life they determine his future existence both subjectively and objectively that is to say in proportion to a person's merits he inherits a better sphere of existence after death that may bring forth an abode in heaven but after the consummation of happiness he is sure to be heard back to an objective life actions are transient and their fruits are likewise so for the properties of a cause are transmitted to its products hence to abstain from works is of paramount importance but it may be said it is impossible for a man to live without doing anything either by the active organs hands feet etc or by the mind even if he turns into an ascetic and retires from the world to live in a mountain cave certainly the necessity for appeasing calls of hunger and thirst of defecation and urination and sleep must yet continue so that if work ceases to produce rebirth literally no one can be freed to avoid this difficulty knowledge is credited with powers of destruction but all works cannot be destroyed apart from the daily and occasional rites and forbidden works or those sanctioned in the sacred writings there are other works which accumulated practice practicant and current that is to say the first refer to works which have accumulated in several previous births the second refer to those which have resulted in the present life and have already commenced to bear fruit which the third comprise the works perform in the present life they will bear fruit in a future life the fruits of accumulated and current works are destroyed by knowledge of self and his identity with brahma but the fructescent can only be exhausted by enjoying their results during the present life it is beyond the scope of the present notice to enter into details suffice it to say that in this karmic law we have a satisfactory solution for the puzzling questions which so often harass us we mean in the instance when virtue stars as said by pope in his essay on man or a learned and able person 
with difficulty scraping together the means of a sorry meal for himself and family and struggling on from day to day not knowing when and where his troubles are to cease or a young and handsome wife suddenly deprived of her husband in the heyday of his youthful career of a poor widow poor and friendless aged and infirm suddenly deprived of her son who was her prop and support and the mainstay of life now instances like these can be multiplied indefinitely they are too common to escape the attention of anyone but what we have said will suffice here the prarabdha karma is the key Practicent works have already commenced to bear fruit, and as that fruit is to bring forth pain and suffering, or the reverse, according to the nature of previous works, consequently an individual is seen unaccountably to suffer, while another who is worthless has for his portion all material comforts. in the case of children dying there is the same operation of the karmic law but it is said that a person may apart from physical circumstances for his bad karma be born blind deaf or dumb and thus be a cause of anxiety to the parents in this way it will appear that heaven and hell are relative conditions of happiness and misery brought forth by the deeds of an individual but opinions differ for which a vedantin is bound to accept the teachings of his sacred scriptures he necessarily pins his faith with the truth there taught he may look upon the blissful abode of the seven upper spheres already mentioned as a result of merit or good works but after their consummation he must revisit earth in human shape and rehabilitate a body that must be a net result of his unexhausted karma Kapila, on the other hand, lays down the doctrine of a man's being reincarnated into a beast or deva in proportion to his demerit or merit. Buddhism teaches after humility there is no more retrogression. That is to say, when a human being dies, he must always be human in his future reincarnations, and not take his chance with beasts and birds or vegetables and stone. Though equally believing in karma, yet Kapila maintains with much show of reason and strength of argument his doctrine of Bhavana Maya Swarira. A person in his deathbed is overtaken with a fixed thought: if he is a lover of horse flesh, his mind will be centered in a horse, so that when he dies, his astral body assumes the desired body of a horse. In this way, a person may be a rogue all his life and yet escape the. torments of subjective or objective suffering in his last moments his thoughts may overtake brahma vishnu shiva or any other deva and sure enough he goes there to reap happiness a practice still prevail in bengal and other countries to bow out the name of ganga narayan and brahma into the ears of a dying person to one who is unacquainted with its signification it may sound unnecessary and cruel but there is a fixed object in view it means the momentous question of sending that person's soul to be received in heaven if perchance the reiteration of name does not come to occupy his mind so as to be molded after it if it would direct his mind mentally to worship or remember his mantram given by his spiritual preceptor he is saved from all hell torments the question of heaven and hell is a relative existence our ancient writers are not very unanimous 
each author has made ample mention of them but there are others who maintain quotes and opposite doctrine for instance heaven and hell are for the enjoyment of happiness or suffering of misery but who is to suffer let this question be first answered a vedantin says the atma or seventh principle is neither an agent or instrument he is passive and does no works he is neither subjective to rebirth consequently death cannot affect him and he is free therefore he is not subject to pleasure and pain under such circumstances the atma is clearly neither responsible for the works performed by the jiva in his career on earth nor is it necessary for him to appear on the day of judgment to receive his sentence of eternal happiness or eternal damnation in hell fire as taught by the christian church our is much simpler and more reasonable it is said for enjoyment or suffering a body is required not the subtle astral body but the physical body which we have all got hands it consequently follows reincarnation is the scene of fruition as it is for fresh action in this sense there is neither heaven nor hell beyond the world heaven and hell are in our own keeping by turning the mind away from objects of sensuous gratification if we live for others abolishing all selfish ends and reverently perform all virtuous actions we do what is best for weak and frail men to do the reverse of what we have just been saying leads to a life of ineffable misery in next existence itself is admitted as a twin condition in which both happiness and misery are the unavoidable lot of all and every one of us a man rolling in riches attended by servants in rich livery living in a style befitting his rank and means courted and flattered by his friends and relations may appear happy to all of us but you will find that he is in fact as miserable as an average human being without his advantages perhaps he is childless or the slave of an insatiable thirst for accumulating more wealth or he is a miserable wretch so far as health is concerned or he may be very unfortunate in his wife no one loves him none cares a straw for his person all his relatives are so many parasites anxiously waiting for the hour of death so that they may be remembered in his last will such is the rule here we can expect no unalloyed happiness the poet's dream of love and bliss are too holy to have a place here our journey through life embraces a long period of time of which a part goes in acquiring the usual training and experience to befit us in this uphill struggle another part is spent in fulfilling darwin's law of survival of the fittest in this way he spent the best part lending us now into the lord of reflection and descriptitude with hears hori sitting reverently as a crown for all the struggles we had in the past now if in all this we maintain an unflinching honesty honesty of word deed and thought we are then more than human show us the man who will say that he has been honest all his days from the time when he arrived at years of discretion and we say that he is an exception no doubt there are men who are fit to be worshiped in every sense of the word men who have retired from the sad turmoil of an empty 
and deceitful world to study self to meditate on the mystic om or to dwell in samadhi these sages or wise men or call them more properly theosophists guard our destinies a wide range of philanthropy actuates them nationality they know not man is the object of their solicitous care and to teach and instruct is a favorite occupation with them we cannot say that the world has become denuded of them but their number is extremely few the present writer has the good fortune to know one who is his perceptor and can hardly express his gratitude adequately to baba parduman singh sadho nirmala to return from this digression to our subject we find it laid down that with death we part with our physical body just as a snake cast off its coil our conceptions and karma remain impressed in the body called subtle or astral linga sarira which is again subjected to reincarnation it is everywhere the unanimous opinion that the astral body continues to come and go till emancipation this is a very shadowy duplicate of the gross body and has 17 characteristic features the five vital airs prana and the rest five sensory organs sight hearing etc five organs of action hands feet mouth anus and genitals together with mind and intellect the human soul and animal soul constitute the linga sarira by the practice of yoga it can be projected out at a distance from the physical body wherever a yogi wishes it to be in this way even the natural barriers offer no impediment to its passage the reader will find it mentioned in its proper place the need of a continued residence with a guru supporting him by begging and satisfying him in all manner by doing menial services never troubling him even for food but waiting to receive whatever he offers neither asking for instruction but bidding his time and pleasure even these require no ordinary amount of patience by a pupil duly qualified for receiving the necessary instruction on brahma vidya under these circumstances it is easy to conceive why the number of such qualified pupils have been getting less and less day by day one must leave the world to all intents and purposes and lead a life of absolute purity before he can acquire that knowledge if it be asked what is the necessity for knowledge for if the jiva be one with brahma and if the natural felicity and intelligence of the latter be alike a part of the former there is no reason why a person is to make such a sacrifice or it may be argued as in common practice we do not trouble ourselves any more concerning a thing already got similarly the felicity of brahma and the destruction of misery being already present in the individual there does not exist any paramount necessity for the acquisition of knowledge put the reply is but the reply is as a person with a piece of gold in his hand forgets about it and is seen to by himself in its search and when pointed out by another he recovers it to all intents and purposes though it never left his possession and he had it already similarly the enveloping or concealing power of ignorance hides the perception of felicity which naturally belongs to him and knowledge alone enables him to recover it then again that knowledge as it is antagonistic to ignorance which again is nothing more or less than matter 
destroys the materials out of which the seed for the future body of the individual is to grow hence being removed from the fetters of cons consecutive rebirths he will abide forever in the brahma whose soul essence is joy destruction of grief is eagerly sought after by man no matter whatever may be his position and as it can only be affected by knowledge we have here another incentive but it may be replied that for every kind of misery there are particular remedies therefore the application of remedies is equally capable of destroying it clearly to say so is a mistake for instance medicine removes or cures a great many diseases that is true indeed but there is no certainty that the disease would not return again in the lifetime of the individual in the same manner pangs of hunger and thirst are removed by a good dinner and drink but there are yet a good many miseries which refuse to be destroyed and there is no remedy for them beyond knowledge when a when a person loses his only son his grief knows no bounds and no remedy is more potent to destroy his grief save the knowledge that his so called son was nobody that it was a mere illusion which tied him in bonds of affection that is the ordinary lot of humanity from which there can be no escape that the world itself is unreal and transient and full of grief we are extremely selfish without an expectation of deriving sure benefits we never undertake a work the authors of the shastras understood human character too well to allow it to escape their notice hence we find it mentioned there are four incentives of them necessity is the last that is to say the necessity of studying the shastras is pointed out in all its bearings the philosophy of the vedanta embraces two subjects metaphysics and physics the first has been considered in all its aspects including a critical review of the arguments of the other contending systems pointing out their mistakes and establishing truth in the elucidation of truth a vedantins analysis and mode of arguing is simple as it is convincing our author has ransacked the whole ground covered by the partitions of special theories and though he had added nothing yet he had by bringing the arguments together in one place rendered ample service to the cause he represents to deserve the gratitude of his readers in regard to the latter he is rather reticent he dismisses the subject with the remark that the world and its contents are unreal therefore deserve no special or particular mention individuals evidently he could not have done justice to it without putting in another volume before the public and the labor of the undertaking might have stood in his way to every religious minded person the physics are unattracting even in the present day we find a conflict between the religion and science the church in the west had received severe wounds from the artillery brought in by science physical these wounds are now being dressed up with care and skill by her custodians bibliogist and the recent authorized transaction of the holy writ has been purged of several very objectionable points in this way to fit in with the facts of scientific evolution the six days of the world which occupied god to create it are said to cover an immense space of time we happily are not similarly placed for we have our brahma's day and night and that means time enough and we have nothing to be ashamed of turning from physics to metaphysics we find a vast array of subjects the sum total of which 
is to show the illusory nature of all phenomena they are therefore unreal the world and its contents are relatively and not absolutely false as in the instance of an illusion of sin sight when a person conceives the presence of a snake in a dark night in a bit of straw rope etc the so called snake is discovered to be false when a light is brought to show what the thing lying in front is by the help of light person derives the necessary knowledge of the rope of all its part when the illusion is dispelled similarly the illusion of the world is only removed by a thorough knowledge of self who is no other but brahma in the foregoing instance the reality of the sight of the snake the rope itself is not at all denied on the other hand everywhere it is maintained as something substantial because without a sight there can be no illusion in the absence of the rope there can be no mistake of a snake in other words we must have something resting on the background so to speak on which to superimpose or project through a force of ignorance the necessary mistake or illusion in the case of the world and its contents what we objectively recognize through the medium of the several sensory organs are so far real having an objective existence with the usual form taste touch and etc but they are non eternal and it is an illusion to consider them otherwise for there is only one entity of that nature and that is brahma now in regard to our body we are apt to confound it and the several organs of sense and etc with self it is the business of metaphysics to establish a correct knowledge of self and to show that the body is not self neither are the organs of sense the vital airs nor the mind come under that category they have been fully dealt upon with the help of the footnotes the reader will have enough to clear his mind of preconceived and incorrect ideas therefore we need not stop for considering them in this place all our sense perceptions are illusions this requires a proof and we have in astronomy a trite illustration stars are classified according to their magnitude the higher are placed in the ascending scale while the lower ones are neither most a star of the fifth magnitude will make its way of light appear in the earth at an immense distance of time all the time the light has been traveling with its accustomed velocity to reach our globe and the telescope can find its sight nowhere the rational is by the time it reaches us the star itself is lost now here we have a ray of light coming from a body that was existing in the time when that light started on its onward journey but since then the law of change has so worked upon matter that the star is lost in the infinity of space to connect happiness and misery with self is a common mistake universally present we find it commonly said by all classes of persons and there is hardly any exception i am very miserable he is very happy these are a few of the instances in common use daily with all individuals according to their experience of grief or happiness opinions are divided according to the several schools of eastern metaphysicians from the vedantin standpoint happiness and misery are created by jiva upon the relations created by him they are not is words productions for instance a father has his son residing abroad on foreign service his neighbor has also one of his sons in a similar service distance from home now when the father of the first son receives intelligence of the demise of his son 
by a person returning from that country he is extremely depressed and his grief knows no bounds similarly that other father is elated with the information that his son was doing well and intended shortly to return home laden with wealth accompanied by a large retinue but the fact is otherwise his son was actually dead while that other son was very prosperous but the man who gave the wrong information owed a grudge to the family and that's why he put the father into unnecessary grief but when the mail brings the good tidings in the handwriting of the absent son he the two taken for dead his father's extremely delighted thus we find that the relationship of the first father with his son artificially created by him is the source of his grief and happiness if the son were the seat of such grief and happiness then for every son each father would feel pl pleasure or pain but that is not the case but how is this relationship artificially created by the internal organ it may be argued the ties of affection are natural and it is improper to call them artificial for throughout nature we find even in the lower animals the same feelings for their young ones that indeed is correct but what is here sought to be conveyed amounts to this isura's creation are natural while those of a jiva are artificial or imaginary if isura would have created happiness in those who are called sons another father would have felt equally for all sons of other persons equally with his own thus then an imaginary connection or relationship created by jiva in his internal organ through the medium of maya leads him to be a source of his own misery the conclusion is therefore evident that all objects have neither pleasure nor pain in them but what pleasure or pain we vainly attribute to them is due to our ignorance this can only be rendered plain by example wealth is generally believed to be a source of happiness if it were so all persons having wealth ought to have been happy but is this really the case by no means we all know how fireflies are attracted in autumn to the light of a lamp they dance and frisk hover and fall into the fire you cannot keep them off to them it is a pleasure thus to be present near the fire if fire were endowed with such pleasing sentiments or say happiness everyone would have likewise felt it in the cold winter with a bitter frost and sharp winds blowing it is indeed extremely pleasant to sit by the fireside but when the dog days come and the hot blast try our nerves we never think of fire we avoid it and coat water thus this should not be if any subject had in its particles of happiness on misery the rational according to the siddhanti is when a firefly is actuated with a desire of touching fire its buddhi loses its changeability and by a relationship with it and desire as it made steady when perception of happiness is realized when a person desires for an object a relation is established between his desire and the internal organ it, it loses its unsteadiness and therefore he cognizes felicity thus we find happiness is not situated in a subject the same thing may be a source of happiness in some and pain in others we all know the function of the internal organ is never fixed or steady it is ever changing according to the subject we which demands its attention it is therefore said to be subject to birth and death but knowledge is not so what is knowledge this is the subject of vedanta knowledge is self that is the shortest and best answer but it may be argued knowledge is only an attribute or quality of self 
through which he discovers all objects. In that case, the question is whether that knowledge is eternal or transient. If the answer be in the affirmative, that will establish self and knowledge identically the same. For self is eternal and not self non eternal. Therefore, to say knowledge is eternal brings it in the same category with self. You cannot regard knowledge as is as a distinct substance from self. In that case, it will be non-eternal. So that to speak of knowledge as eternal and yet distinct from self will be clearly impossible as indicating existence of properties directly opposed to one another. If on the other hand, it be contended knowledge is not self, not self is insentient and devoid of intelligence as for instance a jar. It is non-eternal too because when a thing is non-eternal it is insentient. Therefore knowledge cannot be maintained with any show of reason to be non-eternal. On the other hand it is eternal. But there is only one substance that is eternal and secondless and that is self or Brahma. Therefore knowledge is identical with the self. Apart from what we have been saying, there are other considerations leading to the same conclusion. For instance, a quality of a substance may or may not be present all along. It may appear in a subsequent state of development, remain for a short time then disappearing we find this notably in flowers and fruits the rich juice and sweetness of several edible varieties of fruits are only produced in a subsequent stage of development when they are ripening in the prime stage primer in the prior stages these qualities were absent as they will appear disappear when overripe Therefore, starting with these premises, if knowledge were a quality of self, he would be sometimes conscious and at others unconscious. At least his quality will be short-lived, that is transient. But since knowledge is eternal in duration, his resemblance with self is complete. What continues in all conditions of time is called eternal. We have only three divisions of time, waking, dreaming and profound slumber. In all these states, knowledge continues. Even in the condition of profound slumber, the continuance of knowledge is proved by individual experience of felicity. A person on rising from sleep explains, I was sleeping happily. I know nothing then. This should never follow. If there is no actual perception of felicity and the subsequent resemblance is a fact of positive knowledge, for an unknown thing never crosses the memory. The sensory organs have no relation with knowledge, for in that sleep the senses are at perfect obeyance. They cease to carry on their function, yet there is no absence of knowledge. Thus, then knowledge is eternal, and as self never exists without it, they are therefore one. The necessity for knowledge is emancipation. Works and devotion are quite powerless in that way. They may lead to a better abode, but they cannot make a person free from future rebirths. There are various opinions on the subject, but from a Vedantin's view, there can be no freedom from metapsychosis. Without knowledge, so a theophist has nothing proper for him to do. He is beyond the pale of works and devotion. They are only the nethermost rungs by which the top of the ladder is to be reached. Good works make the mind pure and remove its blemishes. Devotion helps to make it steady. They are therefore only means to the acquisition of knowledge. All works are undertaken with a distinct desire of reaping their benefits hereafter. That means rebirth, but a theophist has no desire of continuing his existence. He abstains from karma.
he waits only to see his cup of proficient works which have already commenced to bear fruit and have produced his present existence drained he is no hurry about it he does not wish for his death to come at once and make him free but patiently abides his time prior to knowledge whatever acts he had undertaken and what have already been done cannot be cannot produce any more fruits for they are destroyed by it it is for inculcating this grand truth that we find an emphatic mention in all treaties dealing on the vedanta that a wise person has no more need of works and devotion when he has obtained a thorough knowledge of self as a result of that he exclaims i am brahma just as a torch is extinguished by a traveler when he arrives at the door of his own house or as the husk is thrown away after the grains have been gathered it will thus be found that knowledge and works with devotion are naturally opposed to each other for which the former brings on emancipation the latter an objective existence in a better sphere or its reverse according to the merit of the works and the dignity of the object worshipped it remains also to be observed that with thorough knowledge actions are incompatible why because self is regarded by a person engaged in works as an agent and instrument he is apt to exclaim i am doing virtuous actions and their fruits must be my portion a wise person has no such desire he is devoid of virtue and vice happiness and misery and he knows self is unconditioned the absolute brahma as regards devotion a theophist knows not any distinction of worshipper and the object worshipped he knows everywhere there is the same play of that one intelligence which is nothing more or less than brahma hence he has no inclination for devotion to look upon self as subject to the bondage of future rebirths is the greatest of all mistakes which knowledge only dispels and in this there is nothing unique for as we have had occasion to mention just as a snake is removed from a rope when it is fully known so knowledge of self establishes his oneness with brahma and he is eternal and free as for the destruction of the snake knowledge of the rope alone is enough for the purpose so in regard to emancipation knowledge of self is capable of bringing it about and there is no need of works and devotion in the shastras knowledge is called emancipation it means knowledge alone is a source of release and works and devotion are not included in it at first sight one is bewildered to find works good of course and devotion are helpless they are helpless in cutting off the chain of conjugative rebirths that is in strict accordance to the karmic law which knows no exception because every action must produce a fruit the meritorious works in this way bear good fruits which a person to enjoy must reincarnate in a better sphere after their consumption he is hurled back into an earthly existence to reap what he had sown in the past similarly the bad works lead to a and neither sphere works and devotion are simply means to knowledge if it be said no theophist in that case can ever succeed in attaining emancipation prior to his knowledge he had been engaged in devotion and good works and they must necessarily subject him to rebirth the reply is therefore is no need for that save and beyond the fructuousent works which have commenced to bear fruits and which terminate with the present life of the individual knowledge is capable of extinguishing the seeds of past karma which are to fructify hereafter the natural acts of eating 
and sleeping and satisfying the natural cause are a matter of habit they cause him no injury because there is an absence of desire in him in other words he is never desirous of eating this or that or discarding another makes no choice of his bad it would thus appear that desire plays no insignificant part either in our present or in determining the future life but opinions are divided and the reader will find the arguments for and against in the usual place in connection with this subject it is worth mentioning there are two extreme views advocated by their respective partisans which restraint and immunity from restraint the learned author of the panchadasi upholds the first as there are others of equal authority maintaining the latter view in the brahmanyaka upanishad we find it mentioning mentioned a theophist literated liberated in life is absolved from works and good and bad unswelled by sinful works uninjured by what he has done and left undone Ananda Giri says the theophist so long as he lives may do good and evil as he chooses and incur no stain such is the efficiency of knowledge the commentator of the vedant sara nirsimha saraswati reviews it in the following words some one may say it will follow from this that the theophist is at liberty to act as he chooses that he can act as he likes cannot be denied in the presence of text of revelation traditionally text and arguments like these not by matricide nor by patricide he that does not identify not self with self whose inner faculty is unsullied he though he slay these people neither slays them nor is slain he that knows the truth is slain neither by good actions nor by evil actions in answer to all this we reply true but as these texts are only eulogistic of the theophist it is not intended that he should thus act thus then we find these porters of immunity from restraint basing their authority of the vedas and upanishad advocate yathis charna forgetting the impossibility of such freedom of action in a person who has acquired the supreme wisdom frequent mention has been made of illusion and it requires a passing notice before we close the source of an illusion is ignorance a trite example is to mistake a rope for a snake but it may be asked how is it produced there are several ways to account for it for instance a nyayika would say a person must have the impression of a snake seen in a previous period of time and a defect in his eye given these two conditions and the snake illusion is sure to follow in other words when a person has seen a real snake in the past its impression remains ever afterwards it may be roused by the stimulus of an object resembling it or by the force of words adequately representing it so that in the dark when he comes across a bit of string that stimulates the dormant impression of a snake seen in the distant past and he fancies he has a snake in front of him which he avoids either by running away or avoiding it anyhow or he may have defective vision and that also brings it about but on the other hand it cannot be argued that a person whose sight is good is not liable to be the subject of a similar illusion therefore this view is not a correct one the vedantin accounts for it in quite a different way his method is called the indescribable in the visible perception of an object the internal organ plays an important part when a substance is seen its recognition takes place by the internal organ establishing a connection 
with the object through the sense of vision then it assumes the shape of the object to be cognized drives away the ignorance resting on it and at the same time illuminates or cognizes the stock illustration of this is that of water flowing from a well or tank by means of a narrow open channel emptying itself into the square beds with raised edges into which a field is sometimes divided for the purpose of irrigation and assuming the shape of those beds the illuminated internal organ is the water and the operation is called an evolution or modification of that organ in the case of an illusion when a rope is mistaken for a snake the function of the internal organ projected by the eyes establishes a connection with it but the obstacles or defects as they are called darkness etc do not determine the modification of that organ as to make it assume the shape of the rope consequently its envelopment of ignorance continues to be present no snake is actually created in it for if it were so a light brought to discover what the thing lying in front is it discovers no more snake but only a bit of string this would not be therefore we find knowledge of a rope is an obstacle to the existence of a snake so long as we do not know it to be so the snake created or superimposed on it by the force of ignorance exist to all intents and purposes relatively though to the individual subject to that illusion <clears throat> then again it cannot be said no snake exists in the rope for on appealing to individual experience it will be found that in all such instances men have been known to behave exactly as they would <clears throat> if they had a real snake before them since therefore you cannot particularize one way to or the other snake is or is not existent it is called indescribable it is a modification of ignorance or better still it's a changed condition there are two causes at work for its production and discovery its formal cause is the particle of external ignorance situated on the rope which transforms it into a snake while the particle of ignorance situated on intelligence discovers it in that changed condition the other doctrines of illusion need not detain us as the reader will find them amply mentioned and argued with all the resources of our author's vast erudition illusion and knowledge are opposed to each other illusion is a modification of the dark quality of ignorance while knowledge is a modification of its good quality which is light itself there cannot be there can be no illusion after knowledge has once arisen the student of soul self knowledge is to mold his internal organ into the modification of brahma now modification signifies assuming the shape of an object in the case of formless brahma how can thought be molded after it this is a question that is easily met what is meant implies no contradiction you are constantly to dwell upon non duality of self and brahma and when that has been firmly fixed in your mind by repeated practice you are in dissolutely one with the subject of your thought in this way i am brahma is the acme of knowledge and height of felicity when that has been fully realized there is no more any hankering left after material comforts pleasure and pain hunger and thirst heat and cold nay the most adverse circumstances will fail to unruffle the calm equanimity of a face radiant with beautiful light various are the means of arriving at this knowledge the usual means discrimination indifference etc only pave the way to it constant study hearing the percepts of a guru versed in brahma jnana consideration and profound contemplation are the chief factor yoga is a sort of self training that helps to make the mind unwavering and steady and leads to the same goal finally all our shastras how 
how much soever they may differ in theory are entirely of one accord as far as mukti is concerned their processes may differ but the finality is everywhere the same in this way that staunch advocate of materialism kapila sees no necessity of discarding final disenthralment from consecutive rebirths with him prakriti साक्षात्कार इज साक्षात्कार इज सुप्रीम नॉलेज द ऑर्डिनरी डिस्क्रिप्शन ऑफ नॉलेज आंसर्स नॉट द सेंस इन विच वी हैव यूज इट एन इग्नोरेंट पर्सन इज सो कॉल्ड वन हु हैज ए कंसिट ऑफ हिज बॉडी वन मे बी ए मैन ऑफ वास्ट रीडिंग येट सो लॉन्ग एज ही मिस्टेक्स सेल्फ विद दिस और दैट हिज फिजिकल बॉडी और द सेंसरी ऑर्गन्स ही मस्ट कम अंडर द कैटेगरी ऑफ द इग्नोरेंट बिकॉज ही कैन नो मोर बी फ्रीड टिल हिज मिस्टेक्स और इल्यूजन इज क्लियर डबे thus we find the ignorant and the wise are the respective seats of bondage and emancipation for the first is marked with desire while the last is perfectly indifferent the potency of desire even shakes a man of firm intellect and whatever indifference he may have is put to an extreme stress so that he has always to keep a thorough watch to mount guard on the doorway of his antahakarna his desire may unruffle him momentarily but the firm knowledge which he has acquired can never bring back the perception of reality in what he has once discovered to be unreal he knows phenomena are unreal material comforts equally so unlike a dull person when he shows an indifference for worldly goods at best it is but an invisible knowledge of their unreality and not a visible perception or it may have been brought about by the presence of defects so that no sooner the defect is removed he is after them again by bent more the accumulation of riches but the indifference of the wise is caused by the visible perception of unreality and if ever be shown any truth regard for them that unreality be removed for the time being but it cannot continue ever afterwards just as a snake is removed when the rope is discovered and there is not a possibility of its being mistaken again thus then as a wise man never become a subject of illusion after he has once discovered it his indifference is therefore called firm whereas in the ignorant his indifference is apt to come and go hence it is said to be produced by the presence of defects that is to say just as a person after coitus feels an aversion for a female and is extremely indifferent to her so in wealth and riches there are defects too which produce indifference for the time being still a person is reagitated with a desire of acquisition the ignorant look upon their self as a mine of affliction while a theosophist looks upon him as one with the brahma whose soul essence is joy but for such knowledge to arise there are several grades hence it is said to be ordinary and uh, particular now the particular variety comes after ordinary knowledge by means of what are called indications in comprehending the transcendental phrases that are thou and their likes the meaning can only be cleared by indication of abandoning a part of the meaning for instance that refers to brahma and thou jiva the proposition is to prove their identity but there is a conflicting element in their composition for both her intelligence yet one is marked with visibility and the other with invisibility therefore by deleting them from both sides of the equation we have intelligence equal to intelligence the reader will constantly meet with the words intelligence and consciousness self and not self being and non being 
they require a passing notice from a vedanta standpoint there is one intelligence pervading everywhere no matter a thing may be insentient a bit of stone for instance yet it is pervaded by it and that is brahma our next word is only another name for it modern science traces in all substances the presence of a subtle force called odil it was first discovered by re-enchant back who wrote a treatise on the subject but only to be laughed at in his experiments very carefully conducted and including a large body of metals metalloids and other substances he had found the presence of magnetism sufficient to influence a sensitive it is everywhere present we have therefore sufficient ground based on science to connect intelligence with bodies appearing <laughs> to all intents and purposes a mass of insentiency self and atma are synonymous they refer to the principle of individuality the perception of i am i he is existence intelligence and bliss what is uncreated and eternal is called being or existence not self includes all objects in short phenomena while self is noumena non being is the opposite of being it signifies unreality what is not eternal is called unreal therefore as the world we live in with its contents are liable to destruction they are unreal while self alone is real destruction of the world is called parle as mahaparle means total destruction but in reference to it opinions are divided the general belief is that no such total destruction ever happens and we have sankhya cards protest against it it was not intended that the whole ground covered by the accompanying work should figure in this preliminary notice we had touched on the main feature of the vedantic doctrine to impart an idea of philosophy and help the reader to form a correct notion of the technical terms with which every philosophy worth the name must necessarily abound and in this we believe we have done our best to succeed it cannot be too often repeated that the subject is vast as it is important and requires a patient study there is much to profit by and a great deal more to succeed in mastering it we it will depend upon a great deal on the personal endeavor and the amount of labor and time spent and in this bring and in thus bringing to a close we cannot but acknowledge with thanks the valuable assistance re- so this topic is complete and in the next video we will start the actual vichar sagar thank you for watching this video namaskar my dear friend thank you namaskar